Hi, everyone. Apologies for getting started a little bit later. Thanks very much for joining our webinar today. My name is Scott Moore. I'm the head of marketing for PeerBridge, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. We all know that with global e-commerce driving unprecedented shipping volumes, businesses are seeking guidance from experts who can help them navigate the carrier capacity crunch. Spend less time and money on shipping and spend more time focusing on their core business. We think 3PLs are here to help. Some quick housekeeping before I introduce our panelists. Our webinar is expected to run 35 to 45 minutes with time at the end for questions. You can enter those in on the webinar panel on the right-hand side. You'll see a little box there for questions. We'll get to them at the end, as I mentioned. Um, we're also recording this, so we'll send this along to everybody. Our first panelist is Bob Maley. He's the Managing Director of PeerBridge, now a part of WiseTech Global. He's been helping businesses reduce transportation costs and streamline fulfillment for 25 years. Our next panelist is Lance Healy. He's the Founder and Chief Innovation Officer at Banyan Technology. He's built a connectivity platform empowering other systems to plug into over 1,400 carrier connections with a particular focus on LTL and last mile. So let's get started with our goals and objectives. We're gonna be reviewing some of the major trends that are shaping parcel and freight shipping management and their impact on 3PLs. Then we'll get into a few unique fulfillment challenges shippers are facing that 3PLs and supply chain professionals are helping them meet. For each of those, we'll explore new methods and technologies or what we're calling them plays that will drive shipping success, controlling costs, streamlining fulfillment, and keeping customer delivery promises. So let's dig into those trends. Uh, first question is what impact is e-commerce having on transportation management in the parcel and freight industries? Lance, maybe we can start with you on the freight side. Sure, yeah, thanks Scott. So I think, you know, to give it a little context in kind of the overall market trends uh, in the LTL, uh, world on the freight side is we've seen a, a, a big increase on the truckload capacity crunch and a lot of that is causing spillover into the LTL market and then further downward obviously into parcel. Um, one of the trends cited from uh, a TIA market report uh, year-over-year increases about 21.5 percent in uh, third quarter billings alone um, and the market has been hovering at about 100% capacity for most of 2018, which has been completely unprecedented in the last several decades. So that freight capacity constraint on the truckload side is really moving a lot more freight into the LTL space just for more pricing consistencies and delivery, on-time delivery consistencies. And that's also driving a lot more uh, larger than parcel kind of white glove uh, home delivery certainly that's having a huge impact from the from the e-commerce boom. Shorter mileage uh, hauls and uh, and and a lot of the shippers and the stores are, are really trying to get closer to their customers by setting up smaller and more frequent warehousing and operation than the traditional big behemoth warehouses. So that's what we've been seeing on the freight side. Bob, what have you been seeing on the parcel side? Well, we've been seeing nothing but growth over the last several years, really. And But we knew that um, Parcel had kind of uh, reached its maturity or had, had really become a center point for e-commerce when CSCMP started covering them as a separate mode, uh, tracking their growth as a separate mode a couple of years ago. And this year, they uh, they reported that uh, Parcel had grown to $99 billion in 2017, which was a 7% growth over 2016. And then um, Pitney Bowes recently did a uh, study, a parcel shipping index report that indicated uh, a similar trend globally. Um, last year, parcels grew 17% to 74 billion uh, in volume uh, last year. Notably, a lot of growth coming out of China uh, who grew 28% uh, to 40 billion parcels uh, last year. And they expect it will grow to 100 billion over 2020. So we've begun to kind of refer to this as the parcel tsunami because with unprecedented international cross-border uh, movement starting to flood uh, customs officials at the ports trying to, trying to just deal with the sheer volume. And although e-commerce and retail are driving the volumes, the, the wholesale distributors and 
manufacturers are also seeing increased volumes as their uh, retail clients uh, start relying on them for, for drop shipping. So they're having to kind of retool their operations so that they can uh, handle uh, increased volume. And um, so as Lance may have mentioned, you know, TSMP also tracked LTL that's growing at about 6.6% last year. And one of the reasons is more LTL carriers are being called upon to uh, do residential delivery of heavyweight items like appliances and, and you know, furniture, gym equipment, where millennials are much more comfortable buying online uh, large uh, items than older generations like myself. And um, so the LTL carriers have really had to kind of, well, not had to, they've, they've kind of rushed in uh, to meet the demand. And uh, it's increasing the volume, you know, one-stop drop-offs that uh, LTL carriers have had to do. They're starting to talk about larger than parcel deliveries um, and uh, LTP. And that's, uh, that's, that's moving the LTL market pretty significantly. And um, Lance, you have, I think you have three PLs that, that, uh, that are jumping into the e-commerce residential delivery uh, service. Yeah, a absolutely. And we've seen probably the, the, the most classic one is, uh, is, is XPO that has really jumped in with both feet uh, on the on the front edge of this trend. And Brad Jacobs acquired the expedited <coughs> one delivery. You know, some of his first acquisitions were in heavier than parcel uh, home delivery uh, companies, as well as expedited carriers that are, are very uniquely qualified for for doing those kinds of uh, shipments and deliveries. And then when he rounded out his string of acquisitions with the purchase of Conway as you know, is the, at the time second largest LTL carrier in the country, you know, that really kind of completed a, a trifecta and really put them in a great position to serve that market as a, as a 3PL, as kind of a one-stop shop. So, and, and at this point now that uh, they can, They've got 90% of the American population that they can touch within uh, 125 miles of their facilities. Um, so that, that's one example. Also seen YRC introduce some residential uh, capacities and, and some real specialists uh, uh, coming into the market here. So it's, it's been very interesting to see. Great. So fair to say a lot of growth um, capacity is really topping out and there's a also a lot of change. Um, how is this affecting the 3PL industry, Lance? Um, you know, the, 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 the industry has typically looked to 3PLs to say, hey, we need the, we need the specialists and the leaders in the market uh, anytime there's really significant change. And really that's what's driving most of the change. Uh, you've got change in technology that 3PLs are adopting more rapidly. Um, and you've also got changes in the market conditions uh, significantly driven by by buying habits, consumer buying habits, e-commerce. And to try to accommodate that, the shippers are trying to change and adapt new techniques, uh, including omni-channel delivery, distributed order management. And a lot of those folks maybe don't have the expertise, the, the resources, the time, or the priority uh, in-house to manage uh, some of that change and that's a, a big part of why they're turning to the uh, to the three PLs. I think that's th those are some pretty significant side on, on the freight side. Bob, what are you seeing on the on small package? Um, similar trends, Lance. The um, you know the three PLs are 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 jumping in where you know there's kind of a deficit in terms of capabilities and assets that the shippers lack. And you, you mentioned omni-channel fulfillment, um, and we talked about Amazon building out fulfillment centers across the country. Um, if you're a 3PL and you can help clients, uh, you know, be become a, a point of shipping closer to their customers, you know, they can get it there faster and they can they can get it there cheaper. So that's um, th that's a way where we're seeing more shippers uh, opt for for 3PLs. The other one is. Um, 3PLs have uh, tend to have more expertise in complex multimodal routing and uh, execution. So as, um, as shippers, you know, are moving away from relying on a single carrier, 
uh, they can begin to rely, rely on 3PLs to deliver, to offer more delivery options to meet the growing customer demand for same day delivery, residential delivery of heavy weight items over the threshold, white glove uh, services, setup services, hold at location services. So all of this takes advanced planning and transportation management expertise and systems. And the three PLs have really um, have really invested heavily in, in that. And as a consequence, their their uh, shippers are spending more on three PLs for their for their expertise. You know, they apparently their net revenues have grown five percent uh, over 2016 last year to 77 billion in all transportation, which not just parcel but parcel and freight, and gross revenues 10 percent, so to 184 billion. So. Um, where there's where there's money and opportunities, the three PLs have shown agility in in jumping in and and making it happen. We do note that traditional three PLs who have been used to kind of truckload and and freight brokerage, freight under management, are having to think carefully about how they, you know, move to parcel because uh, brokerage opportunities are much less uh, prevalent in that. You know, FedEx and UPS don't really allow resale of rates, and they're the dominant carriers in the U.S. But um, the USPS, uh, U.S. Postal Service, has begun has over the last few years offered uh, commissions on priority shipments. So um, it's opened up a, a niche for uh, 3PLs to make money on parcel transportation. They can also make money on uh, parcel consolidators, working with pol- parcel consolidators like. Logistics, uh, for example, who offer consolidated returns, uh, consolidated draw, you know, cross-border injection into USPS uh, delivery networks. So that uh, that whole area is really attracting a lot of 3PL activity. But uh, you know, they have to retool their operations in order to account for the the much higher volumes that come through their facilities and uh, moderator yeah great um so aside from accessing that specific expertise how also is the shippers benefiting right uh, yeah well the, the the big and obvious piece is this and uh leveraging both the, the the pricing uh negotiating skills and the buying power of a 3pl um you know last year the the spot quote market the prices went up over 30 percent which is really unprecedented. Um, so having that professional expertise in into the uh, um, in your corner is is really helpful. Um, the other thing, as Bob mentioned, is a lot of the complex supply chain uh, infrastructure that takes relationships, that takes uh, um, knowledge and how to manage across different modes. It's a lot uh, faster and and often less resource intensive. To, to outsource that um, that skill set, and then uh, the big driver is for manufacturers, distributors, retailers. Everybody has different priorities, and if the freight and logistics isn't always the most important thing in in a manufacturer's world, as opposed to setting up a new plant, and you know that's what gets the attention. and And the three PLs are can can help continue to improve that process. Even if it's not done internally at the at the manufacturer distributor level, so that that's what we see as a, a lot of the big benefits. There. Great, thank you. So let's dig into one of our first shipping challenges. That's the carrier rate volatility. Um, Bob, what's going on with rates in parcel? Well, as many of you uh, on this call may have seen, uh, UPS and FedEx recently published their general rate increases for uh, 2019. And it's in keeping with uh, the last several years where rate increases have uh, have increased at twice the rate of inflation. So uh, the current inflation rate is 2.5% or thereabouts. And the general rate increase uh, for UPS and FedEx uh, will be at uh, 4.9. Now, uh, on top of that, though, we noted the special services are increasing even more. Uh, for for FedEx, the delivery area surcharge is 5.8% increase for ground, 55 for express on top of the general rate increase. And if you consider that 55% of the population live in extended service areas, 
those kind of surcharges start adding up uh, and impacting uh, margins pretty significantly, particularly if uh, we're, uh, shippers have to absorb the cost. Oversize in particular, um, as parcel carriers meet LTL carriers in the middle on large shipments, 12%, 12.5% increase, 100% increase on returns to a dollar. And of course, UPS has introduced a holiday service surcharge. So it's, you know, bottom line is getting more expensive uh, than ever to, to ship smaller shipments. Um, and over the last 10 years, FedEx and UPS rates have increased 43%, address corrections 100%, delivery surcharge over 70%. So it's, um, it's well exceeded the rate of, in, rate of inflation, which is probably one of the reasons why USPS is getting so much uh, attention with priority services. They don't have residential surcharges. They don't have delivery surcharges, area surcharges, no fuel surcharges, no DIM beyond zone four. Uh, so they've be, you know, become a, a more aggressive with commercial rate discounts. So they're, they're, they're starting to get, uh, you know, they're being taken very seriously by uh, shippers and, and 3PLs alike. And again, you can't blame UPS and FedEx for charging as much as they do. There's a demand for the valuable services they offer. But, uh, you know, shippers are, are really looking for relief. Even if you look at Amazon that does spends about 21 billion, close to 22 billion on outbound shipping. They lose, take into consideration, um, you know, prime shipping. They still lose 7 billion a year on shipping. So even someone with their, uh, you know, a company with their negotiating power, um, the fact that they lose, still lose so much on shipping is, is uh, noticeable. And uh, if you're a small shipper, or even if you're a 3PL, you have to begin to look at what you can do to to offset uh, offset those uh, you know increased costs. And Lance, I think similar things happen in in freight. But I'll, I'll let you uh, yeah comment. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, absolutely. It's uh, so uh, yeah, we've definitely seen it's a very flush market, and the pendulum swings uh, you know that way for the carriers for a while, and um, and the rates are obviously increasing. Um, but what we're seeing is um, more than just increasing rates. We're, we're seeing carriers get a lot smarter, um, and they're 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 backing away from opening up blanket rates uh, with with uh, 3PLs um, because they just don't have the visibility to the freight. Um, and so we're seeing the 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 the, the smarter 3PLs um, uh, approach the carriers with a lot more. Uh, client-specific rates and negotiating them on behalf of exactly what each of those individual clients' needs are. Um, and what that does is it, it, it mitigates the risk for the carrier um, so it, they can dial in their profitability by the, the account that the, that the 3PL is bringing them. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a win, win for everybody with, with more transparency there. Um, so, in, in a lot of the the 3PLs are looking at their overall portfolio um, and managing uh, to a yield um, rather than uh, tonnage volume or a number of shipments. Um, uh, as the as the carriers get smarter, um, uh, they're able to, uh, to to work with the carriers and be really transparent on on the kind of business they need, where they need the help from this carrier or that carrier. Um, and if you're not already in the LTL game, it is very, very hard for a, a new 3PL to break into that market. Uh, it's not impossible at all. Um, it takes dedication and a, and a lot of hard work to get there because uh, the carriers just don't feel like they have to give the, the margin away right now. Um, so if you can add some value to the carriers, give them insights, give them uh, some knowledge, um, you, you'll find the, the 3PL friendly LTL carriers that say, hey, thank you, this is great. And uh, as the carriers are continuing to evolve their pricing structures, including dynamic pricing, um, and uh, it, it's a lot, uh, the typical static tables and routing guides 
um, those days are, are, are long since gone in terms of the, the carriers even extending pricing that way. Um, so a lot of change, a lot of opportunity, and a lot of challenges. Great. So let's uh, dig into some of the plays that help that people can help overcome these challenges. Exactly that question. How can 3PLs and supply chain uh, professionals help shippers con control costs and better manage the rates? <clears throat> Lance, do you want to go first? Yeah, and to, to dig into that a little bit deeper, if you know, if, if you want to get better rates, you got to be a better customer. Um, so if you know exactly what you're worth to the carriers, um, uh, and, and by saying what you're worth to the carriers in the freight market, everybody kind of operates on an operating ratio or an OR. Um, so it's good to know, ask your carrier, say what is your what is your target OR and and where in specific lanes or freights or customers, where are we not meeting those expectations? It's very different than what the industry was, you know, 10 years ago. But it's 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 bringing bringing that transparency to the table. Um, now for um, uh, the shippers and and whatnot, they're they're seeing their rates go up pretty dramatically as well. Um, and it's good as they're engaging with the three PLs to say, hey. Those three PLs, they see a broad spectrum of rates and markets, especially as they're doing customer-specific rates. Um, so they can they can give you really good benchmarking and some some ideas on 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 what it might be. Um, and the the really advanced three um, PLs are we've seen some some really neat tactics. Um, they're not doing annual bid packages anymore. Essentially. Uh, there, we've got some that are renegotiating their rates every two weeks, and some that do it once a month, uh, which sounds absolutely horrific uh, if you're thinking of it in a, terms of a, a bid, um, a traditional bid process. Um, but really, it's it's about creating um, these uh, these feedback loops um, and 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 giving information back to the carriers um, so that they can refine. Um, Freight and pricing to what they want, um, and then uh, that they mutually approve that. Um, so very, very different. Um, uh, it does impact, you know, how a traditional freight audit is done uh, because they tend to be structured around negotiate it once a year. You throw it in a lockbox and maybe make an adjustment for a general rate increase. This is one of the most dynamic markets in the. In the in a country, and really encourage people to to treat it that way and work together as as networks change. So, I don't know, Bob, did, did any of those tactics translate to the uh, parcel side? I think so, Lance. Maybe even more so because um, traditionally, parcel has been you know there've been no standards that uh, any of the parcel carriers follow in terms of how they rate, how they process shipments, how they track. Unlike uh, freight, where you had, um, you know, you, at one point you had, it was a regulated industry. So rating for, for freight, and particularly the volume of rating required for freight has been, uh, has, has, hasn't been as um, a big of a challenge. So I think um, the ability to pull together data, uh, as you mentioned, for auditing, and but also for analytics to look at, um, you know, how pricing is, 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 is impacting where there could be savings based on uh, surcharges and, and dim fees and so forth. Um, I think we're seeing more, more companies go to a multi-carrier system that can look across all, all the different carrier services. And it puts them in a, in a, in a good position to negotiate. Um, we always say carriers negotiate rates every day and shippers might do it once a year uh, in parcel. So carriers have a, a natural advantage in terms of the data that they have. Um, so working with a 3PL who has a broader perspective on the market, as you mentioned with benchmarking, Lance, um, is even more important now than ever with you know rates racing at twice the speed, you know, twice the rate of uh, inflation. Um, and then um, again, it, certainly uh, following the omni-channel uh, thread uh, 3PLs can certainly help reduce the distance for for shipments by b bringing customers closer to their clients. One of the challenges we see as 
parcel and the you know the lines blur between parcel and freight is um, freight carriers are, are are probably not known as much for their uh, sophisticated infrastructure. Um, if you use carrier APIs to to rate uh, at the in the same way that you might use um, parcel uh, carrier APIs. Sometimes the availability is not there, and you can wait two to fifteen seconds for rates to come back from a freight carrier, which is would be unheard of for 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 parcel. So you know the freight carriers have a ways to go in terms of um, you know upping the ante in terms of uh, their technology. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing that, Lance. Uh, absolutely agree. Um, yeah, it, uh, it's a different market, and the the frequency for the, the freight quotes in commercial industrial is a little bit different than the, on the certainly the e-commerce and the parcel side tolerances are a little bit more lax. So I think the, the LTL carriers have been able to get away with it, but yeah, it's definitely a problem. Right. So let's turn to our next challenge, air taxes. These are the dim fees that are hitting all our shippers bottom line. Um, maybe Bob, will start with you first. Uh, how are parcel dim weight rates and space, uh, impacting shippers? Um, impacting them quite a bit, in I guess you could say, in the same way that um, hotels want to sell out their rooms and uh, you know get occupancy up. Carriers want to cube out their vehicles to you know maximize revenue based on their assets. And um, the f to get there, well, I give you an example. In 2015, FedEx wasn't able to deliver all the holiday packages that they should have been able to deliver. And Fred Smith famously went on a rant at a, an investor uh, meeting uh, soon after that and said, started talking about the poor packing habits of shippers as one of the reasons they weren't able to meet their delivery promise. So they, um, you know, the shippers were shipping just too much air. So over the next year, they lowered their dim factors and as a consequence realized about 100 million in additional dim fee revenue. And it's uh, it's been reduced uh, again since then. So uh, increasingly, shippers can expect to pay more for, for cartons and containers that have too much air uh, in relationship to size. And they can, you know, they can expect to pay more. But as... Um, as a result, the dim fee policies have made it much harder for sh shippers to accurately determine shipping costs up front, their cost of sales, um, their ability to quote shipping charges, both in order entry or even in purchasing. Uh, one client said to us, you know, they have to pack the carton or load the pallet to accurately determine rates, uh, and by then it's too late. So um, it's, it's a problem. Uh, and you can't blame the carriers; they want to max out their 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 vehicles. Um, I don't. I think you're probably seeing the same thing with space space rating, Lance, in, in the freight industry. Uh, oh yeah, it's it's that's absolutely been evolving uh, pretty dramatically as well. Um, you know, there's there's really three factors. You got the the volume uh, of inside of the the trailer, the weight that it's allowed to haul, um, and uh, and then the time on you know, how quick do you need it there? But uh, um, uh, we've seen carriers that have uh, uh, enforced a lot of the, the non-stackable surcharges. So uh, we see some shippers that'll put the little triangles, they'll tape the little triangles on top of the freight so that the carriers don't put anything on top of it. Um, and, you know, a few years ago, eh, you probably get away with that and the carrier would still just charge you for what the price was. Um, now, if you can't put anything and double stack it, uh, you just bought all that space. Um, so they have uh, carriers are enforcing that a lot more. Um, ABF is was probably most famously for for this year really uh, taking a step in and introducing a, a truly dimensionally based pricing. Um, FedEx, UPS, XPO, a lot of the other carriers also have uh, dimensional tariffs available. Um, and, and for some folks, it makes sense uh, based on uh, the NMFC rules um, and how freight is, is, is categorized versus uh, true dimensional. So uh, it, in the very right situation, it can be a win. But for most of the time, it's, I think it's forcing behavior changes 
uh, for uh, shippers to, to 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 do do better and and consolidate some of the packaging um, and, uh, uh, and 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 get tighter, more dense freight, uh, so the carriers can put more on the trucks. Great. So let's let's continue on with those the, the plays. Um, Lance, you want to just carry on with how 3PLs can help reduce the impact of dimensional rates? Uh, yeah, I think one of the things they can do, it's, it's uh, reducing the, the impact of it on a, is really about um, uh, kind of getting more specific uh, to what it is. So um, a lot of kind of the fat in the tariffs um, may be around FAKs, which is uh, freight all kinds. And, and really those, those mask a lot of the true dimensions and the density. Um, so um, the carriers, as they're trying to build their trucks and their line hauls, um, if if they don't have accurate information at the time of the, that that freight is getting booked, it's hard for them to build and close out their their trucks that they're going to do into their their hub and spokes. So um, uh, removing some of those things, um, if they're getting forced into that 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 dimensional uh, piece, is be as accurate as possible. Um, and that takes operational changes to track skews, dims um, from different um, uh, from different product mixes, whatever's in the the, the company's catalogs. And and in other times, uh, we've seen um, folks really be successful at it where they'll get a a dual rate call at the time of the order, um, but they really won't know how many pallets it's on, you know, really what the dimensions are. Uh, until the pallets are built. So then they may do a, a, an additional rate call once it's packed uh, and then be able to, to get um, more accurate data at that point. And, and it also ensures that they're not pushing out the door. Uh, we, we in the freight world call it Jenga freight, um, which is boxes that are stacked all over the place and really sloppy on a pallet. Those have been some strategies we've seen. Great. And on the parcel side, Bob? Yeah, I think um, the biggest uh, thing we've seen is the adoption of uh, cartonization technology uh, by 3PLs, where they can use advanced mathematics and algorithms to to determine what the most transportation cost-effective method of packing cartons, building pallets, or loading containers would be. It takes away all the it, you know it takes away all the guesswork. Um, you load you know skew dimensions. Uh, weights, uh, business rules, and it just instantly calculates what the what the best way of uh, containerizing it is. What's interesting and what, what really took us by surprise is uh, we had always assumed that WMS systems and OMS systems and ERP systems um, did factor transportation costs into containerization, and the reality is they don't. They, you know, it's really the availability you know how many steps to uh, to the pick, but um, you know with transportation cost uh, increasing at twice the rate of inflation, uh, 3PLs uh, are now looking at implementing cartonization and containerization as a way of uh, saving transportation costs. We're also seeing you know more negotiating of of uh, dimensional factors, dim factors. We're also seeing a shift to carriers that don't have dim factors, such as uh, U.S. Postal Service uh, after the Zone 4. So, yeah. Great, so thanks. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so we'll just turn to the the reverse of the e-commerce now, the returns, and we'll dig into that challenge. This has been a growing trend, an increase in reverse logistics volume, for e particularly on the e-commerce side. Um, Bob, do you want to start with telling us what you're seeing on the parcel? Yeah, it's a, it's a very significant in parcel. Um, in fact, some you know some research shows that you know in in apparel industries, uh, you know, the return rate can can be as much as thirty percent. And some some businesses have built like Warby Parker have built returns into their go to market strategy, but. Um, you know, returns has to be simple. Uh, it's got to be it's got to be convenient for the customer, and um, you know, it's it's a it's a major part of what what uh, 
particularly e-tailers, uh, are offering. Their po their policy has to be clear and and free. <laughs> Lance? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, for on the freight world, uh, returns are usually a function of damage um, uh, uh, it, rather than, you know, the, the dress did fit. Um, so it, for that, it's a it's a different it's a different market on that side. Um, we've seen some strategies of uh, you know some, some box stores that have uh, will write in uh, you know 18% of damage uh, on almost every order uh, as they know that at 20% damage they want to go ahead and ship the stuff back and and take a look at it. So there's there's a whole uh, opportunities and, and markets for folks that are holding for inspection um, or that are damaged for a lot of the local delivery folks to be able to come in, swoop in, grab that freight, bring it back to a warehouse, then either uh, either ship it back or or, uh, or or hold it for restocking and um, you know some temporary warehouse services that the three bells can offer. Um, so there is there's, there's a lot of opportunities uh, in there as this trend in e-commerce and returns continues to grow. There's real opportunities for three pills to jump into that market. Great, thanks. Um, any other ways that three pills can add value to the returns process, Bob? Yeah, I think um, there are there are more um, consolidated. You know, U.S. postal consolidation plays out there that that uh, 3PLs can take advantage of, like uh, Nugistics. Pitney Bowes just acquired a company called Nugistics, and they use a smart label that enables uh, consumers to just drop off a, a return package to a postal service, and uh, those packages are consolidated and line hauled to uh, USPS DDUs and. Uh, it's become a you know a very economical and uh, fast way of uh, solving the returns problem. Um, the other one is uh, probably technical, uh, where we're seeing more uh, more shippers embed widgets, return widgets within their websites, so that, to provide uh, their customers with a self-service returns capability. Customers go to the site, they click on a button. They create a label, they schedule a pickup, and then they track the returns uh, to, through to the uh, destination, uh, to the, you know, to the 3PL. Um, we're also seeing this in healthcare, where uh, labs are providing widgets to their doctors and doctor clients and, and hospitals where they can track inbound uh, samples and, and lab and lab material. So it's um, that's a way of driving more uh, SEO to the websites and, and providing more upselling capabilities uh, or capacities while uh, the customers are on the site. So those are those are two trends that we've we've been seeing lately. Great. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit uh, into global. <clears throat> and uh, We've been talking a little bit about e-commerce and how this is becoming a global phenomenon, um, and international fulfillment is also part of that. Uh, Bob, do you want to talk a little bit more about this on the parcel side? Yeah, um, I think it just stems from the fact that when people buy online, they don't they don't really pay attention as to where if they don't want to have to pay attention as to where the goods are coming from. So, uh, according to Pitney Bowes study, sixty percent, sixty six percent of consumers shop online 40 percent purchase goods from another country and um, that shipper has to figure out how to get it across borders uh, deal with customs regulations which are increasingly complex and um, of course tariffs will add a, a, a wrinkle and so a lot of a lot of shippers just kind of throw their hands up and turn to 3pls who offer uh, freight forwarding services I mean even UPS and FedEx do to help them navigate uh, international waters. So we're seeing, as, as a consequence of all the, the global volume, we're, we're certainly seeing that with our, our clients. And Lance, what are you seeing for freight? 
Yeah, it's it's a, on there. It's it's certainly not as consumer driven for for pallets to come to the house. So, um, but uh, so a lot of the the, the carriers they typically partner um, uh, with with providers, like you said, with the freight forwarders, uh, with some uh, customs house brokers uh, that are bringing stuff inbound, um, and uh, we don't see a whole lot of. Um, uh, uh, of, of, of crossover, a lot of the larger uh, carriers may have an internal department, uh, but a lot of the 3PLs will will work directly uh, with those providers. So, and it's, or 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 partner with them, or uh, get into that market through acquisitions. It's pretty common as well. Great, and uh, let's talk a little bit about the plays here. Um, Bob, maybe you can start talking about how 3PLs are helping customers manage the complexities of cross-border movement of parcels. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more uh, 3PLs try to, you know, jump into, I guess, first first mile pickup, cross-border consolidation, injection into last mile delivery parcel networks. Um, you, you know, FedEx offers IPD. UPS offers Trade Direct. Seiko is a 3PL, is an air freight forwarder that uh, offers first mile pickup in China. They handle the cross border and customs clearance and then perform the last mile delivery. So they, they eliminate, uh, you know, a lot of the consolidation into warehouses that, uh, that did, uh, you know, by doing that, they, they are able to achieve a faster and less expensive, uh, less expensive delivery. So um, those kind of you know consolidated, deconsolidated cross-border uh, plays are are, are increasing uh, by the day. Great, Lance. Yeah, we've, we've seen, yeah, yeah, we've seen, yeah, we've we've seen a lot of the the um, uh, again with the, if it's not a part of their core DNA, it's part of their 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 historical offering. Uh, they'll typically see partnerships. We've seen. Um, folks like uh, like uh, DSV, um, this is the fourth largest ground carrier in Europe. Um, a couple of years ago, they came in and just and then they started a domestic brokerage, and then very quickly they started uh, doing some acquisitions and kind of from from the outside in, uh, rather from the inside out, as 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 another trend where um, very successful global companies are are coming into the American market and. Kind of establishing their own operations rather than than uh, than than partnering on that side. So it's another another pressure for the 3PL and and another opportunity to consider um, as as they're getting into that space. Great, and uh, we'll move into our last challenge in play here around uh, 3PL client community needs, and we're I think we're running a little bit long. Um, so. Seems like 3PLs could be potentially faced with clients that have very different processing needs, rate structures, reporting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, Lance? Sure. Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of different uh, styles of 3PLs. You've got the transactional 3PLs that are are dialing for dollars, looking for freight every day from wherever they can find it from. Um, uh, and then you've got more of the holistic 3PLs. They're also known as like a 4PL, where they uh, really take uh, all of that customer's freight and they're more of a, a, a complete solution provider. So in, in that situation, um, it's not unusual for, for 3PLs to support a, a huge variety of clients. Um, a lot of them, uh, they want to see a, a wide variety of offset seasonality or uh, you know uh, the, the types of freight that's being shipped. Um, but uh, uh, not only are the rates different, uh, the delivery requirements uh, to a retail location versus a grocery store versus an industrial dock are very different, um, and uh, they need to be able to, to react to all those. Great, Bob? Yeah, and I the, uh, second what Lance said is 3PLs can end up, you know, they wind up trying to support a lot of different uh, technologies to get after different sized customers in different industries. So um, you know they're they're starting to look more and more to reduce the number of silos they have and get onto a you know one-stop shop platform. 
great. And uh, so we'll just dig into that play uh, specifically. Um, how can they reduce the number of solution silos that they have to support? Lance, maybe you can go first, please. Yeah, yeah, I think if, um, and, and where we've seen a lot of 3PLs make investments in there's some kind of some federated uh, TMS platforms, which is really kind of, you've got a core system that can uh, support a wide variety of workflows for different clients um, and their various needs, uh, but it's all feeding into one centralized database um, that, uh, uh, that, that they can manage the business uh, in, a, in a very holistic manner. Well, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I like the uh, the reference to federated, you know, meaning a, a central platform with, um, you know, a different controls for each for each state <laughs> for each client that's on the platform. Also, seeing the extension of to, you know to the extended enterprise, 3PLs uh, needing a platform that can, you know, where suppliers, the customers, customers can log in and and um, you know, manage their freight. It's uh, it's increasingly important. Also, visibility and analytics. Uh, you know, having all the data in one in one data source is uh, you know increasingly important, particularly if they're trying to manage um, transportation costs. Uh, great. So I think that's really wrapping up the material that we wanted to cover today. So um, we'll just look to our uh, questions. It was one that I saw that came in a little bit earlier. Uh, somebody wanted to learn a little bit more about white glove service and what that is and what it means. Sure. Um, and Bob, I'll jump in, take a quick crack. Of, uh, sure. it, it's, a, it's a broad definition that means uh, something different almost every time. Um, but yeah, probably the most common definition that we've seen in the in the, the, the courier space is that um, it goes beyond, it goes over the threshold and might include uh, a room of choice um, or some light assembly, some removal of dunnage. Um, uh, those, are, those are pretty common. So if you think of like in terms of like an exercise, piece of exercise equipment um, or a, a mattress or furniture um, uh, in, in that context, each contract would be defined to identify exactly what that quote-unquote white glove service is and what it is not. Um, and then that's that defined service is what's paid for. But in general, it's it's just kind of a term called white glove. Yeah, we, we've um, – if you can think of it as a concierge service. <laughs> I, yeah, I won't like want that. to bring, bring some, something into the house – Take away the trash, um, set it up for you. You know, increasing levels of of service. I talked to a three PL who called it not last mile but last inch. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so just a reminder, everyone, you can ask questions in the webinar panel. Go to webinar panel. Uh, usually, it's on the right hand side. Um, I, Lance, you were earlier talking about the pressure pressures on 3PLs and those can translate into opportunities. Um, I wanted to understand what you thought was the biggest threat to 3PLs and maybe put, as a corollary what those big opportunities yeah. are. Um, I think for, for a 3PL, um, uh, some of the biggest threats are, are continuing to extend and add value to the offerings. Um, I think uh, a lot of the carriers um, have, have painted targets on the three PLs and are looking at leveraging technology to take advantage of that. And then, uh, and then I think we've got to see, uh, and then I think we got to see uh, um, uh, visibility on uh, the, uh, 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 you know, the, the rates um, and, and how aggressive the carriers are going to extend those rates to folks. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah, I would say some uh, 3PLs also need to look at, you know, to what extent will the marketplaces, Amazons and so forth, come in and use their buying power and infrastructure to uh, outsource logistics services. Great. Um, just something that I'm sure we've all been reading about this uh, impending or current trade war. 
um, that are going on across. Is there, what kind of an impact could that have, Bob? Well, the more complex international cross-border gets, uh, the more opportunities there are for freight forwarders, 3PLs that offer th freight forwarder services. It's, um, you know, systems, you need systems and you need local, you know, brokerage rules, um, I'm sorry, local customs rules built into those systems in order to, you know, uh, avoid any delays or, or sanctions. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions that we, ha we have time for. Um, I, you know, I like this concept of uh, 3PLs where they can um, offer a move towards multi-carrier shipping that includes couriers and other last mile couriers, carriers, excuse me, um, and this, the concept of the federated TMS platform. Um, I wanted to know, Bob, maybe you first, what is the one critical insight that our audience can take away from today? And then maybe you can answer the next same question, Lance, after him. Yeah, I just think um, if you're a 3PL, uh, you've got to be able to retool your operations to suit up to meet the volume requirements, both in terms of speed, uh, speed of rating, speed of execution, tracking. It's just not something that that uh, th 3PLs that have traditionally um, managed freight or, or freight brokerage have, have been used to. And Lance? Yeah, and I, I think there's there's a real opportunity for the three PL that can take the longer view. On uh, you know, there's the full truckload. Everybody's making money on it right now, and everybody's doing it. Uh, and those that put themselves in a position to really take advantage of of some some long term trends with e-commerce, with home delivery, with couriers, and they really start to establish themselves, um, they can get a foothold in for years to come. Uh, and get ahead of a lot of the market. And I, I think I think that's the opportunity in front of the the 3PL that's kind of go outside of their comfort zone um, and really look into expanding their offering. Uh, I, I think that, that that's a heck of an opportunity for them. Great, thank you, and uh, thanks also to our audience today. Um, we're going to wrap up a few minutes early. Um, on the screen here now, you can see some contact information if you wanted to reach out to either PeerBridge or Banyan Technology. Um, we're going to follow up but with an email that will include the presentation. And when the recording is ready, we'll also share that. Out. But thanks again. Have a great afternoon. And uh, hope your holiday seasons are wonderful.